And on today's show, why real returns generate real money versus nominal returns are just advertising. Part three of this week's series on annuity retirement income with nationally recognized retirement expert, Curtis Cloak. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Backroom Technician and Innsmouth. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to day three here, Curtis. Thank you, Steve. It's good well, to be here. We, there is a lot to this. We're just touching the surface this week to introduce you to all the things that you can do. And I want to talk about the, this theory because so many people, they just throw these slides up and say, look at the return. And talk a little bit, give me a little difference on what's the definition of nominal versus real. Well, nominal returns is really what the market does. And, uh, you know, for if we just look at this slide here, Steve, uh, this is an interesting slide. Uh, what this slide is represented, by the way, I love the study done by Thornburg Investments Real World Return. There's a white paper that you can Google. They've been doing this for about 15 years. And what they do is basically they collect the data at the end of, for the end of the year and they release the reports after the analytics are done in August of each year. So what I'm showing you is a slide that was completed August of last year for the ending year of 2012. And they're always looking 30 years in the past. So this goes from 1982 to 2012. And this happens to be focused on the S&P 500. Uh, specifically, and, and this chart just basically shows what the, what the actual efficiency of the S&P actually did. And you know, what, what people believe or what people think is what the market does 10.8%. That's, that's the number up here in the nominal return. Well, that's what the efficiency of the market does. But I have a question for you, Steve. Can you, I, or anyone else go buy S&P Direct? No. No, you got to go through a conduit of some distribution, or Vanguard or somebody, right? Well, so you can't buy it for that. Well, but before you even get there, you have to understand that this illustrates no deposits after I put the initial deposit in and no withdrawals. So I have to assume if this is my retirement finish line, for example, and that's the beginning of when I start investing money, that all the money I'm ever going to have I put in 30 years ahead of time. Well, that's not plausible. Mm -hmm. And then it assumes I put it all in just one sector of the market, the S&P 500. And then it assumes that no matter how ugly and how close to the finish line, I don't flinch. Those three things are not plausible. So understand we're never going to get the efficiency of the true market in this sense, but this is a great picture that gives us the math. And obviously we want a straight line. We want as smooth a ride as possible to get from point A to point B. But because we have to go through a conduit to buy the S&P, they build in a 50 basis point fee drag. Now you can buy the S&P funds from a Vanguard or somebody less than 50 basis points, but if you're getting expert advice and service, 50 basis points between the conduit of distribution plus the advisor services is a reasonable expectation to assume. Then, if this is after tax money, and they're assuming a 28% tax bracket, so if you're in a different tax bracket, of course it would be relatively different, and then they interpolate 3% inflation. When I take it down for fees, taxes, and interpolated inflation over that 30 years, it isn't 1080, not even close. It's 5.79%, and that's if I had perfect mm -hmm. behavior, right? Then what they do is they look at all the sectors in a similar way, use a similar format to do the calculations. And they tell you what the nominal returns of each of those sectors are, and then they tell you what the real returns are. Now, it's amazing if you look at just the average equity position and the bond position, you just assume a 50-50 blend, which is representative of what most Americans do, is some sort of a blend between equities and bonds over time, which may be problematic, I might add, in the next 30 years as compared to the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. But you'd be lucky if your real returns, the money you kept, net of all those things was three and a half, four percent Perfect behavior. Lastly, this, uh, this additional piece of the white paper says, look, the darker shaded area is the highest return. What if I have less than 30 years? So you can see what the nominal returns were if I have less and what the worst, the best and the worst. So the lighter is the worst. So again, this assumes perfect behavior. Well, if you look at the Dalbar studies and if you look at other studies about client behavior, I call it the emotion commotion. They buy when they shouldn't buy. They sell when they shouldn't mm -hmm. sell. The reality is that people on average, when you consider all these things on a nominal basis, they're lucky if they average over time 3%. But when you build in calculations to real returns, it's difficult for them to imagine a profit net of inflation. And so when we focus on our returns, there's three things that we're really focusing on really mitigating when we build the retirement plans. So nominal returns isn't the same as real returns. Correct, not even close. So, so what we need to do is this kind of advertising, but it doesn't take into account all the components of taxes, fee drag, RB, personal behaviors, and of course inflation. Yeah, so what is the three components? Infl fee, inf uh, th fee, taxes, and inflation. 
If I can focus on a way to buy income where I'm mitigating fees, mm -hmm. I'm mitigating taxes, not eliminating, but I'm mitigating, mm -hmm. and fees I do eliminate, mm -hmm. at least in the strategy we deal with, and I build an inflation-adjusted income for the essential inflation level. I'm not going to take care of all hyperinflation issues. That's what the rest of the portfolio is for. I'm going to invest a piece in the market with an eye toward hyperinflation. But I can build in a 3% or 4% mm -hmm. level of inflation, and when I do those three things in concert with one another, I can create a very efficient, not necessarily real return type of a retirement plan, but I can build a retirement plan that's a lot closer to providing implied yields and internal rates of return like or near like real returns as opposed to being far away from nominal returns. And so it just takes less of the portfolio to generate the necessary income to fill that jagged edge of gap that we talked about in a prior show. We come back from the break, we're gonna talk a little bit more on our other side, which is real returns with all these things taken out of it to see what the real dollars are. We'll be right back in about 30 seconds. Back in the day, life insurance professionals were called field underwriters. Then, carriers trained their field force in the basics of life insurance underwriting. Today, the insurance industry doesn't educate the agent population as they once did. But now, you can have the informed risk guide at your fingertips so you can illustrate a reasonable rate class for your life insurance prospects. Just request your copy of the informed risk guide at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. It's free from Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Okay, well, we're back with Curtis Cloak. Curtis, we're talking about, uh, now we're going to do a little more reality, real money. Uh, let's talk about your three basic income strategies. And I like this because it really blocks it out for me and explains it. Walk, walk us through this. And I have to tell you, I, until I met you, I never heard of SWIP. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, there are lots of different strategies that, that are really con too complex to talk about in a, a show like this. But I'm going to get real basic. I'm going to narrow it down to just three okay. basic. And there's lots of, of, of taglines that you can, forks in the road, you can go off of this. But the first one is systematic withdrawal and complain. We call it SWIP. Uh, it's a traditional strategy. It's the one that's been used for years and years. It's modern portfolio theory. It's safe withdrawal rates. It defines this safe and protective withdrawal rate based on history and analytics and, and testing of the Monte Carlo simulations. But you know what? At the end of the day, uh, though you can do all of that, at the end of the day, it doesn't build in for black swan events. The 08s of, 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 of the experience of the market, it, it can't predict those kinds of things. So even though you can take the, 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 the fiduciary standard and the, and the typical theories that exist out there and be very prudent mm -hmm. about building a retirement plan. At the end of the day, quite frankly, it's an assume and then consume strategy. You're making assumptions and there's no guarantees and then you're consuming and crossing your fingers and kind of hoping it all works out. And there's ways to do that with a lot more confidence and there's ways to do that with a lot less confidence. And I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna diminish this idea because we do this for clients that demand it all the time. This is just one of the strategies. The second one, which has become very popular over the last few years. It's what we call the bucket laddered progressive time segment of money. Uh, all, all the different strategies of bucketizing and, and, and laddering buckets and then these progressive time segments. However, it, it, could, it could combine some guarantees along with some risk assets. Nothing wrong with that strategy. It requires, though, projective rates of return assumption when you're doing the time segments mm -hmm. where I'm guaranteeing the front end and then I'm a half, I, I have to, in order to be uh, accomplish my goals and be successful, there's a certain element of return I must achieve on the various buckets as they come closer and closer to the time of income. And then the time second transitions from growth into income, and of course, until it does transition to income, the money's certainly at risk. I, I get back into potentially the assume and consume unless I actually flip those to some sort of a, a guaranteed income later. Uh, but the, the one that I really do favor a lot is the retirement income floor. Uh, and I'm gonna, for the purpose of this, I'm gonna talk about the guaranteed income solutions of the floor. And, and really, there are two ideas of the floor income. Number one, essential needs. I'm mm -hmm. just going to do essential needs and put everything else in the market. There's nothing wrong with that idea. There are a lot of folks want to put more in the market, and so we'll work on a, an essential basis. Others say, you know what, I'm going to throw the golf club membership in there. I'm going to throw the vacations that are a little bit more extravagant than an essential vacation. And so we may just say, what's your lifestyle before you retired? And maybe you've got enough resources with suitable split of the assets where I can buy income on a lifestyle income mm -hmm. floor basis. So it's not that I'm trying. So if you incorporate all this into your plan, I'm, if I'm hearing anything, it's, this is beyond, hey, I'm going to have medical expenses. I'm going to have long-term expenses, long-term care expenses. I'm going to have regular living expenses. I'm going to put a coli on that. Just make sure I take care of that. But I might want to uncover, hey, I always go and visit the grandkids every year. 
Yep. I always take a vacation. I can start incorporating all the things that are my lifestyle and incorporate that. And then I'm going to buy a floor of income. I'm going to buy a floor to take care of all that. I'm surprised when we do this, Curtis, we're buying present value. We're going to shop the market again and say, which one is the, going to cost me the least amount? Is And I'm always amazed at how much I have to do on the security side to pull that number off and how much I have on the annuity side to pull this off. Well, again, I don't have to. I don't have to apologize for my returns. I can compete with the market when I when I drill out the fee drag, when I drill out the inflation, and when I consider the mitigation of some of the tax mm -hmm. on FIBO and FIFO. I don't have to apologize about these things. And so, being made, being able to build a retirement income floor while still performing mm -hmm. for the portfolio as a whole, I don't have to apologize about that. I don't have to give mm -hmm. it up. Uh, the, the last thing I was going to say about the floor is kind of a new one that's really not on here. Uh, obviously, we're we're buying income that, for that gap whether it's essential, whether it's lifestyle, and then the rest is for growth, liquidity, and legacy. But I like the last one I'm going to tell you about. There's some entrepreneurs out there who are also philanthropists, people that love giving money. There's a different idea of, mm -hmm. of, of retirement income floor that we're focused on with a whole subset of wealthy individuals right now. We don't call it the retirement income floor. We call it the retirement income max. The question is, what's enough for us, me and my wife, and what's enough for them, the kids? I buy my life insurance second to die. I pay it up. I buy my income, I, I create a, a standard of living I say is extravagant enough, I don't need any more, build in a level of inflation, create some growth, liquidity, and legacy assets besides that, and then everything else, I just want to figure out how to affect the world. I want to have a life of significance. Mm -hmm. So those are the really the retirement income floor strategies, and they may be a hybrid. We do a lot of hybrids mm -hmm. where we're doing the bucket ladder time segment in, in addition to the retirement income floor. But the really, where it's at, my opinion, is the floor strategy. No, I, I think a lot of people say, well, Steve, I, I understand uh, SPIAs, and, and now you're introducing this new product we were talking about, which is really not new, these deferred income annuities. I'm, I know that, and there, there's the foundation, but a lot of people were not putting in Coley's. And one of the biggest objections to that is because they say, well, but then I, I lose at the, bot, at the front end, I get a discounted premium or a discounted benefit. Well, what they don't understand is that we've tested thousands of these since mm -hmm. 1999. I mean, we really have a 10-year head start on the market in terms of testing these things. And the reality is, the longer you delay, the higher the IRR. The higher the COLA, the higher the IRR. The higher, longer you pay out, the higher the IRR. So when you're looking at it holistically, not with mm -hmm. just a single quote, and you're looking at all the math, you actually lift up the total performance of the portfolio, and you actually, over time, shrink the assets that you need present value to fund that income. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas you hear on our show, always consult your tax advisor, your legal counsel, and your broker-dealer compliance officer. Missed an episode? You can go and view any of our past episodes at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. And remember, you could be wiser as an Ash Brokerage advisor. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you tomorrow.